Greetings, friends of astrobiology. Welcome to our brand new episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists. My name is Sanjay Som, and every month we bring in a distinguished guest who talks to us about life, about science, and about the future. And this month is no exception. We welcome Dr. Aki Robert of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, in the United States. But before we start, if you have any questions during this show, please use the hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter or use the, uh, the chat room on Saganet. This program is made possible by contributions from the NASA Astrobiology Program, ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, and the nonprofit Blue Marble Space. You'll notice my new background this month. Uh, Mike, if you can cue the, uh, the background from last month, did anybody guess what it was? It's actually a high altitude lake in the Andes, and it's a very thin lake, so the bacteria that are in the lake cannot protect themselves from the UV radiation by going deep. So they develop a pigment, and that's the red that you see in the lake. So this is like extremophiles in action at high altitude in the Andes. If you can guess what my current background is, in particular what these features are, if you know the answer, please use hashtag AskAstroBio, and we'll talk about that background uh, next month on the program. So Aki, welcome. Hi there. So it's no secret that you are the study scientist for the Louvoir Observatory, which we'll talk about in a minute because it's a very exciting uh, mission concept. But like we like to do in this show is turn back the wheels of time a little bit. And I was curious if you could tell, that, tell us, bring us back to young Aki and what made her into the scientist that we have today. Yeah, thanks. It's, um, it's actually... It's not obvious, really, to, to be quite frank with you. So to start with, um, my, my dad was a potter, actually, believe it or not. Um, and he was in Japan in the late 60s, early 70s, studying pottery. Um, he was teaching English at a chemical engineering company to earn extra cash. And that's how he met my mom, who was uh, working there as a chemical engineer. Um, so I was born there. I was born in Japan. And, but we moved here when I was only three months old, um, moved back to the States. And I grew up actually in Vermont in this uh, tiny one horse town. I, actually, no, it, there are more, there's more than one horse, actually, to be quite <laughs> honest. But there's one paved road, no traffic lights, no, there's, when I was a kid, there was a general store, one general store, but that closed long ago. There are no sh stores in East Hobson, Vermont. <laughs> And um, it was really, you know, it's really just a, a little, you know, little small like farming village with a, also a, a kind of a strangely high proportion of, um, of artists living there. And Seems like there's a lot of land so, to go on adventures. Yeah, actually. So I did go exploring in the woods a lot, actually. And um, in a way, actually, maybe my first possibly my, my earliest love in science was maybe in more in the, the um, biology and zoology sort of area, just from like, you know, collecting tadpoles out of a pond in spring and like watching them grow legs. Um, but, um, but then, you know, as time went on, so, so I, I had an interest, I guess I had an interest in, in science even when I was a little kid, although I'm not sure it was that conscious in that way. Um, uh, but then, you know, I started high school, and so I took the first class, which was biology. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. I want to be a biologist. And in particular, a molecular biologist. We actually, we actually did a little of that. Um, and then I took chemistry. I'm like, oh, this is even better. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do chemistry. And then I took physics. And I'm like, okay, that's all right. Okay, that's the one. <laughs> and so, um, so then I, I was, but you know, but I, I did lots of other things too. I was, I did a lot of, I studied, I was, spent a lot of time in the art room doing art. Um, I read voraciously, I always did, uh, mostly fiction, sci-fi, fantasy mostly, um, and mysteries. And, um, and then actually my senior year in high school, I could, I'd finished all the science classes at my high school. And so I was allowed to take um, the freshman level science classes at the local college, which was Dartmouth, actually. Um, and so I took astronomy, and I was like, ooh, yeah, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you have the mindset to, of an astrobiologist interested in chemistry, <laughs> biology, <laughs> physics, astronomy. <laughs> yeah. And I will say my second, sort of my second favorite topic in science probably is biology, in fact. Um, so, uh, but then I, it was time for undergrad and I was at the time super happy to, you know, get away from this tiny, tiny <laughs> one horse village. Um, so I went down to Cambridge at, to start a, a bachelor's degree at MIT. Um, so I did a bachelor's degree in physics with a minor in planetary science. Um, at MIT, then, uh, you know, and I was, and then I, you know, just to, you know, I, I followed the usual path of a scientist, which means you go to get a bachelor's degree, four years and get your bachelor's degree, although actually I took five. Um, then you'd start a PhD program, which I did at uh, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And there I was, uh, I studied um, astrophysics. I got a PhD in astrophysics. Um, and then I did what many scientists do, most scientists do, what's called the postdoc. And the best analogy for that is basically an apprenticeship. Um, you, you spend like three years uh, after you get your PhD, you spend three years um, doing research with a mentor, you know, or an advisor. And you really just put your head down and focus on learning, learning all the other things you need to do to be an independent scientist that are hard to teach in school. Like, um, okay, now I have to, I'm the one who really has to, I have to come up with my own questions and come up with my own plan for how I'm going to solve them and find the resources that I need to do that, whether that's writing proposals to get, to acquire new data or proposals to get money to work on those new data and just learning how to like, learning how to manage yourself here as, a, as an independent researcher. And those, those apprenticeships, those postdocs are, you know, you know, a feature of science. A network with um, other scientists too, right? Yeah, that too. And that, that, that apprenticeship is an important part of, um, one of the important things you need to do then is to, you know, broaden, meet more people, talk to more people, broaden your collaborations. Um, and it's also a good opportunity to start taking your research in your own direction, sort of maybe more away from um, what your PhD advisor was doing. So, um, so yeah, you talked so, about, and then, yeah, you, you talked about mentors. Um, I'm just curious about if you could tell us a little bit about some of the influential people who kind of guided your thought process as you became an independent scientist. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Well, first of all, um, I have to give a huge shout out to my undergraduate thesis advisor, um, who is Jim Elliott of MIT. Um, he was his most. I think he's most most well known. He was he was the person who discovered the rings of Uranus. He was a solar system a solar system scientist. But his his legacy <clears throat> to science was has more to do with the fact that he he had a huge he had a huge stable of of undergraduate researchers. He was incredibly committed to teaching, and he basically he never said no to anybody. If he walked into his office, said like. I need to do research or, you know, I want to do research. Can I work with you? He, he basically gave, he almost, he basically never said no. Um, and so many of his students are still active in the field. And he, he was, um, he was wonderful. I remember early when I was working with him, um, he taught me my first lesson <laughs> in, in, in science in a way. One of my first lessons in science was like, don't walk into my office without an error bar. You know, so, so, and a then, data point without an error bar is meaningless. It's true. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a data, a fact without a certainty is, is useless. You know, um, and then my thesis advisor, uh, you know, Paul Feldman at uh, Hopkins, at Johns Hopkins, who was also a solar system scientist. He was uh, he studied comets um, mostly. He studies comets mostly, actually retired, but still working. Um, he uh, he kind of taught me sort of this, the second lesson was that like a second really important lesson was like, what's the question? Look for the look for look for the, um, the important question that actually matters, and and you know like answer it as best you can, and then move on. 
Um, so this is, and then move on instead of, um, I don't know, instead of like how to not end up going down a rabbit hole of like ever increasing detail that doesn't necessarily answer the, the high level question. And so it was kind of like a good balance between the two of them of like rigor and precision and like eyes on the prize. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Some so that's just, words. you know, I, I learned, yeah, they were, they were together. They're You know, they gave me, you know, fantastic, fantastic combination actually. What was your PhD topic? Ah, it, actually, my PhD talk, topic, <laughs> let's see, what was the title? Uh, ultraviolet spectroscopy of circumstellar disks, I think. Um, but what it was really was I was looking at the materials that are in these rotating disks around young stars. And it's in those disks, and those materials are, in those disks we think planets are forming. And... Um, and they're forming out of these materials. And in particular, I studied the sort of the stage when you've built up tiny, tiny interstellar dust grains have it built up into like comets and asteroids. And then they're starting to smash together and some of them stick and some of them just break up and that material and, and a lot of debris is created when that happens. And so these disks are called debris disks and they sort of correspond, we think, to sort of the late stages of the formation of rocky terrestrial planets like the Earth. And I was trying to look at the materials, the composition of those materials and those disks to learn something about the building blocks of rocky planets in, around stars that are very different from the sun. So that's what I was doing. Uh, and that actually is still, that still is my, you know, my personal research when I get a chance to do some. You know? Very cool. So. Could you tell us a little bit about how spectroscopy works and why that's important? Mm. Yes. Spectroscopy is, so if <clears throat> people are super familiar with imaging, this is taking pictures, and that tells you what something looks like. Spectroscopy is how you try to find out what something's made of. Um, and so, so like say light, light from a star passes through a, a cloud of gas. So, and as the light passes through that cloud of gas, the atoms and molecules in that gas can absorb, can take out particular colors of light, um, particular wavelengths of light, particular colors. And each you know, molecule or atom has a particular fingerprint of like what colors, what exact colors of light it can absorb. And so if you then record the light that from the star that passed through the gas and then record it, you look for these these dips in the light at particular colors, wavelengths, and you look for that pattern, and that tells you, that can tell you, ah, that's carbon monoxide, for example, or that over there, that's you know oxygen gas or something like that. So that's basically that's basically how spectroscopy works. So you're looking the, for, yeah. So right. uh, excellent, and then the reason I asked you that is because this is important information when studying. Uh, the composition of atmospheres on exoplanets, which is where Louvoir is going to get uh, really cool yeah. data if it ever flies. And so perhaps in your own yeah. words, as a study scientist for Louvoir, can you tell us a little bit about that telescope? Yeah, so yeah, so right, I'm working on a, it's a, it's a NASA mission concept study for um, a mission that at the moment we're calling, we're calling Louvoir. Now I know the acronym sounds like it's French, but it actually stands for large UV optical infrared surveyor, um, and it's it's not a great name because it's we're in early stages, so you know you don't need a fancy name at this point. Um, but it's kind of a it's basically a concept for um, really a, a super duper duper Hubble that would be a, a really a, a really general purpose observatory like Hubble is, like the James Webb Space Telescope will be. Um, that has like covers a, it, it looks in a broad wavelength range at a lot you know from the ultraviolet into the near infrared with a bunch of different kinds of instruments that can be like that could be serviced or upgraded and um, it would have broad capabilities um, like like Hubble does the capabilities to answer questions that we can't think of that we haven't thought of yet. But one of its key science goals, which is why we're here, <clears throat> it's really key science goals, is to actually do spectroscopy. Like I said, the spectroscopy you mentioned is to study the atmospheres of 
rocky planets that are in the habitable zones of nearby stars that are like the sun. And not what just does that mean? Do yeah, okay. So, um, so the whole goal here is like we want to understand, you know, we want to understand the, you know, the uniqueness of the Earth. Like, and, and are we alone in the universe, right? Um, so what do we think? What, so the first question is, so what is it about the Earth, I'm looking out my window for the moment, um, that, that makes it hospitable for, for life like us? Okay, well, liquid water is one thing, right? Because all life on this planet needs liquid water at some point in its reproductive cycle, in its life cycle, um, to, to survive. So astronomers, you know, on the basis of that simple, you know, observational fact about the Earth, you know, sort of have calculated, okay, like, well, what's the distance from a star around a star? What's the sphere around a star within which a planet like the Earth would receive the right amount of, of starlight, sunlight, starlight, um, to have liquid water on its surface? And that's, that, that zone is what astronomers call the habitable zone. So, um, so, and for the moment, so astronomers are looking we're looking for, for planets that are basically like the Earth in our search for habitable conditions and for life, because for a large extent, not because life can't exist in other in other ways, like on the Earth. I mean, just look at Europa, where maybe you have life underneath this thick shell of ice in a subsurface ocean. Europa being a moon of Jupiter, of course. Yes, yeah. Um, but astronomers, we're sort of folk, we are kind of focused on the Earth. And sometimes, you know, people say like, well, you're ignoring all the other kinds of life that could be out there. But we're not doing it because we think that the only kind of life that can exist is Earth-like life. We're doing it because Earth is, in fact, unique in the solar system in one way, in that it, it's the only planet that's abundantly covered with surface life that is actually affecting the planet's atmosphere. So most of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from life. Most, and the methane, most of the methane in our atmosphere comes from life. Um, and that's probably the only kind of life, only kind of signature we can actually detect from interstellar distances anytime, anytime in the foreseeable future. So, so that's if Louvoir was, yeah. if Louvoir was uh, around another star and looking at Earth, it could tell that life was uh, existing on the planet and how? That's our goal. Yeah, that's our goal. And, um, and in particular, I'm actually um, I'm hopeful as a personal goal is that um, that Louvoir should be able to tell that if it was looking at the Earth from far away, from interstellar distances, that it would be able to tell the Earth was inhabited throughout the whole inhabited history of the Earth. Because Earth's atmosphere, Earth's been inhabited for almost as long far back as we can see as we can tell but it wasn't always the atmosphere wasn't always the same it was always being affected by life but in different ways um you know if you want to, this would be a time you, if you want to talk about the archean earth now <laughs> so enjoy this would be the time <laughs> so, yeah so i mean uh, i'm an archean scientist and so understanding the, uh, the how the earth has evolved through time in the atmosphere gives us a perspective of known habitable worlds, because in fact, the easiest exoplanet to study is our own planet early in its days, because the atmosphere was completely different in composition and in structure and was very much alive. So that's where I think where geology yeah. can inform astronomers like you. And that's the beauty of the discipline of astrobiology. We have scientists from all these different disciplines working together to uh, understand yeah. whether there's life elsewhere. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah, no, it absolutely does. And I'll say that, like, you know, in the early you know, not that long ago, astronomers kind of were so focused on the modern Earth that we, I think, didn't pay enough attention to the fact that the Earth didn't always look like the modern Earth. So, you know, in the Louvoir study, we're, we are, in fact, trying to pay a lot more attention to that and make make a system, make a tool that could tell, could take data that could at least tell that, you know, at least that all the different ways the Earth looked um, because of life you know, during its whole history of life on Earth, that it would be able to make those measurements to tell it was inhabited. Um, but we're also just going to look, you know, look for, you know, how many planets are there, are there out there that have conditions on them that would be hospitable for life like ours, for Earth-like life, whether they're inhabited or not. Um, that is also an interesting question, you know, to my mind. 
So, and the, the point of, one of the points of Louvoir, you know, it's a really, I should say, it's, it's a big mission concept. The con the, this concept is, is, it's really enormous. I think it's in the eight to 15 meters, you know, mirror diameter range, you know, for, for comparison, Hubble is only 2.4 meters in diameter. Um, so it, it's really big and it, it has to be because actually observing and, and doing this spectroscopy of an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star at interstellar distances is one of the hardest observations astronomers have really thought of, you know, really seriously thought about trying to do. So it needs a very, we need a very capable, we need a very capable space observatory in order to do that. So, and that's what we're working on now, trying to figure out, like, the actually design this thing, at least at, a, at least at the first stage of design of this thing, anyway. Um, so is designing a telescope something you've always wanted to do? Is that the reason you joined NASA? Or how did you go from postdoc to being a study scientist for a next generation telescope? That's yeah. an amazing uh, yeah. path. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And it's not perhaps typical. And I must say, it's not really what I expected, what I was planning to do in grad school. I, you know, in grad school, I was going down a path of a, a pretty standard path that would normally, maybe if you're lucky anyway, lead to like a, a professorship at a university. Um, but while I was a postdoc, when my first postdoc, while I was at the Carnegie Institution for Science, um, uh, I had the opportunity to, well, basically my advisor, <laughs> Alicia Weinberger, she was asked to uh, serve on a mission concept study for actually an ultraviolet astrophysics mission concept. And she was super busy. And she said, like, I don't have time for this. Why don't you ask my postdoc? <laughs> so, um, so I did that, and I found that I really enjoyed the work. I really enjoyed um, the creativity and the, imagine, you know, the creative, I don't know, the, the creative puzzle of like um, thinking about future missions, figuring out the questions and how to answer them and the tools to answer them. And at that point, I kind of realized that like I really would rather do that than than do, for example, classroom teaching. As important as that is. Probably not my metier. <laughs> it's not my forte. Um, so, this so, and that, yeah, that led me to a postdoc at Goddard, actually. And then, you know, the rest is sort of history. <laughs> so. so, I want to go back to this 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 problem solving process. It's people people mm -hmm. that I encounter sometimes think that us, us scientists are kind of the aliens, right? We're this weird breed of people that think differently. But but not really. You know? I mean, we use a scientific method. <laughs> yes, in some respects, that's yeah. true. But but uh, like if if you're a parent talking to a child or an adult talking to a child about about the thought process that goes into becoming a scientist or or just being a active citizen, what, what would you tell them? Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. I was I was thinking about that, that this morning and. And I guess I'd put it, I'd start with this, basically, this, this statement, and that is, like, um, everyone can do science. And by that, I'm actually not even talking about everyone, anyone can be a scientist, as true as that is. My point is, is that um, everybody actually uses the scientific method in their lives, whether they are realizing it or not. And the crux is basically, you have a fact, and you need to explain it. So you make a theory and you test it. If it fits, good, you can do something about it. If it doesn't fit, you make a new theory and you figure out a way to test it and get get gather new facts. Now, it, that sounds like when I say it like that, it sounds kind of, you know, you know, weird and sciencey, but actually there's the, the analogy for this is is troubleshooting, okay? So like, I can't load this web page. What's wrong? You know, ah Maybe is it something wrong with the web page? I will check a different web page. Can I load that one? Oh, I can't. Okay, my internet is down. You know, why is my internet down? Is it just my computer or is it all of the computers? Oh, it's all the computers. Maybe my router is bad. <laughs> you know, so like, is it plugged in? Oh, hey, my kid just unplugged the router. Ta da! You know, <laughs> so, um, so this is in that process. Like, have a fact. Okay, I have a, and then I make a theory. The theory is, you know, this web page is broken. You know, I test it. Oh, no, that doesn't, that theory doesn't fit the new fact that I just gathered. 
So you test it again. This whole, the whole concept, the whole process of troubleshooting um, is basically the scientific method. And so in this process of, it. in this process of troubleshooting your telescope, do you think <laughs> we'll find life out there? You know, I do actually. I put myself. I kind of put. I I'm, tend to be in the optimistic camp on this one. Um, I think. I think recognizing it might be harder than finding it. Um, but the fact is, you know, it seems like life on this planet arose as fast as it could. Like the earliest, every year that goes by, I see new papers coming out from people who study the early Earth saying like, oh, the origin of life is even earlier and earlier and earlier. So it seems that, um, it seems like the, the, the second, the second it could, life arose on this planet. So, which kind of suggests it's a, it's a pretty robust, maybe it's a robust process that just, you know, wants to happen. So, um, and also too, the range of conditions that life on this planet can both not only survive, but thrive in is extraordinarily large. Um, and again, we learn more about that every year. You know, there are, you know, that's what field astrobiologists do, I guess. Um, so I kind of, and, and then also too, the ingredients of habitability, like water, carbon, um, those materials we've learned are, these are common materials in space. Um, so I feel like it just, you know, it is circumstantial evidence that I would say maybe that, that nature may have stacked the deck in favor, in favor of life. And so we have to look for it. That's the theory. And Louvoir is the experiment to make the first test in a way. That's so um, cool to be about, part of. <laughs> yeah. What, so, what do you think that like, we'll this, do you think it'll, it'll, it'll be a lot of social implications? Yeah. When is it launched? Uh, well, Suppose. Well, <laughs> yeah. Right. See, a large, you know, a large NASA mission like this, this takes decades to come to fruition. If it ever does, you know, that's no guarantee on that one. Um, if we're lucky, if we're lucky, this thing will launch in the 2030s before I retire. Hopefully, <laughs> I hope. But hey, if it doesn't, that's okay. I will happily enjoy the results from like a deck chair. That's fine. <laughs> so, you know, I guess that's another thing about being a NASA scientist. You have to be, you have to have a lot of, you have to have a lot of, have a lot of patience and sort of like stick to itiveness because, you know, this, the stuff we do, the really ambitious stuff, it takes a long time. <laughs> and a that's lot of very people. That's very true. A lot of most, of people. Yeah. most missions that go to space take decades to develop from the initial idea to flight like decades so yeah. uh, I wish you good yeah. luck on that on that uh, path <laughs> so we've been talking to yeah. half an hour for about half an hour I think we can, it's, it's a good time to open it up for questions from the audience otherwise we'll talk about exoplanets forever which is I have no problem with <laughs> but uh, let's see here who should we start with Graham hi Graham so his question is what do you think the next major discoveries will be with regards to exoplanets and star system evolution? Huh. Hmm, interesting question. It's hard, really hard to answer because the whole field of exoplanets has been, to be quite frank with you, very unpredictable and unexpected. Um, I mean, everything about it has kind of been a shock to theory <laughs> and from, the, from, its very, or from its very beginnings. Um, but I, the thing I'm looking forward to actually most for the relatively near term here is, um, the, the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, which will be launching in 2018, is going to try and take, um, take a close look at rocky planets that are in those habitable zones, like I said, of red dwarf stars. Now these stars are really different from the sun, they're really low mass. They're low mass and they're cool. And um, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm really, the thing I want to know is like, what are the atmospheres of those planets like? Can they even have atmospheres? Um, they, it seems like planets around these, these, these low mass stars, these really small red dwarf stars are extremely common. They're the most common type of star in the galaxy. And they, it looks like they have a lot of rocky planets around them. Um, so the next step is like, 
great. Do they have atmospheres? And what can we even start to begin to find out what, what those atmospheres might be like? Are they Earth-like at all? Can they even be? You know, so that, I think that's that's kind of what I'm looking forward to in the next, you know, two to well, like you know, next within the next five years, we're going to start start taking a look at that question. Actually, it's amazing so. how the galaxy keeps surprising us in terms of the diversity oh, of exoplanets yeah. that exist. It's unbelievable. I know. When, <laughs> Yeah, for the first, you know, for like the first 10 years after exoplanets were discovered, I swear I could, um, you know, I could sit down, I could probably rattle off like four different ways from theory to prove exoplanets can't form, <laughs> you know, and yet they exist. <laughs> so, and yet they existed. So they, uh -huh. from the beginning, they were a challenge to theory, absolutely, a planet formation theory in like so many ways. The, the range and diversity and the robustness of the planet formation process is enormously greater in, in so many ways than we than we had any idea when I was be first being taught this theory in undergrad, you know, so. This is goosebumps <laughs> creating, <laughs> so we should move yeah. on. <laughs> so Janet Ashley Pollock asks whether the LUVOIR telescope could only detect carbon-based life or would be able to detect also other based life. Oh, I, I think it could detect other kinds of life, but whether we'd recognize that we've done so or not is another question. Um, you know, it's hard to know. It's hard to make a prediction for what the signature, the, the atmospheric signature, what, what biosignature gases, life that's very different from the Earth um, could produce. We just, we don't know. It, uh, we don't even, we, barely, we don't really even know enough to, to design a specific test for that. The best we can do is what we are trying to do with LUVOIR is to make a, a, a telescope and an instrument, a tool that is flexible enough to um, make unexpected discoveries, make measurements, and that we could discover things that we didn't plan to discover. And so that, that's kind of the best we can do. So I have to say, yeah, maybe we could detect it, but would we know we had that's a tricky question. That actually will require a great deal of both work from um, uh, about ex people who study life on this planet in extreme conditions, um, you know, people who do, you know, who, who try to think about the theory of what kind of life can exist and how it would work. I mean, it's, that's a so, huge, huge field, actually. A yeah. So Luvar, Luvar could that could then detect that a planet is inhabited but would not be able to tell what kind of life is there right because arguably any kind of life would uh, would cause a thermodynamic disequilibrium in the atmosphere well, i.e the presence of methane and oxygen right right see that's what that would so yeah so lubar could detect what he just said disequilibrium gases or what we also call biosignature well disequilibrium gases basically these are two gases that are present together that just shouldn't be there under the laws of like chemistry or physics. They shouldn't be there together. They should destroy each other really fast. And if they are there together, you sort of have to like, okay, well, what other science is left in the building I can invoke to explain this? Ah, biology. So, um, and so that 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 disequilibrium is um, is what we call a biosignature gas. Problem is there are, there are other ways of getting disequilibrium chemistry and atmosphere too, like volcanoes and stuff. So you'd have to, it would be hard to interpret. You'd really have to, you know, just taking the measurement would only be the beginning um, you'd ha and, and seeing a disequilibrium. And you'd have to like try and make sure that it isn't caused by some physics or chemistry that you didn't think of yet, that is actually caused, you know, caused by life. So. I can't um, wait for that session at a future astrobiology conference. <laughs> Did we detect light? Yeah, actually, you know, How incredible would that be? Uh, you know, <laughs> right. Someone who's actually spent, one of my colleagues who spent a lot of time thinking about what we would call false positive biosignatures, like ways of getting these disequilibriums, gases that shouldn't be there together, but we can't, about the false positives, how that could happen without life. It's actually uh, Sean Domical Goldman here at, uh, at NASA Goddard. He might be a good person to ask. <laughs> You want yeah, to hear about that. We, should, we should have him on the program for sure. This reminds me, yeah. uh, those of you who are viewing, if you have any scientists that you would like us to interview, let us know, hashtag ask AstroBio or send us a note on Sakenet. Um, okay, what is the next question here? Um, 
Ah, it's another one from Graham. He sees your PSO J318 <laughs> poster on your wall. <laughs> um, his question is, if you had to guess, how common do you think rogue planets are? And what is a rogue planet? Oh, well, I don't know. I'm, I haven't heard that term before. Do you mean, maybe he means, I, I'm assuming he means free-floating planets, planets that have sort of yes. escaped their star and are just floating in interstellar space, which is uh, yes. amazing. Uh, um, apparently, they exist. Um, and actually, now that we know a little more lately about the planet formation process, all, in retrospect, you always say like, oh, well, of course, they should, we should have realized that. In retro, you know, hindsight is 2020, but the fact is during the planet formation process, a lot of things get ejected from the system. You know, we, we always knew that like, you know, comets and asteroids were getting ejected. It probably, maybe we should have guessed that planets, whole planets could be ejected too. And now, um, now we find that there are free floating planets out there just, you know, in interstellar space that have were formed, presumably formed around a star and just, you know, they maybe they two planets had a close encounter and one of them got, you know, knocked out of the system and just went off. I think it's a sad thing to happen to a planet because, you know, it will be sort of get very cold and dead, you know, eventually. But, you know, um, that's. Yeah, so I don't know. That's about what that's about what I know about the free floating planets, actually. <laughs> uh, and that's not. I don't think we know much more than that, actually. Too. We just not again one of those things that we were not expecting to happen with exoplanets. That's Plus so cool. The theory. <laughs> yeah. That, either that or it's a Death Star. Who knows? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. This Richard is Gordon asks. Richard Gordon asks, how far how far away could we detect lightning on an exoplanet? I don't know. I don't know if we can detect lightning on an exoplanet at all, actually, yet. Um, I would like to do some calculations to see if we could, but we haven't done them yet. Um, we definitely can't do it. I don't think we can't do it anytime soon. Maybe with LUVOIR, um, but I haven't done any cal the calculations to see if that's feasible. Um, I would love to do that. That would be cool. That would be cool. Um, I also, all right, I will put somebody on that. <laughs> awesome, yeah, because that would be an indication of weather on an exoplanetary system, which would yeah. be cool. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we do want to be able to look for weather. So, for example, we want to have the the ability to observe the planet quickly enough that we could look for the planet's spin. So, look for its day-night cycle and seasonal cycles, and um, and then once you have that basic pattern, you could look for variations around that those, that cycle that would be indicative of weather. So yeah, we want to have that capability with LUVOIR, definitely. Cool. Janet, um, I'm going to ask you to uh, rephrase your question because I don't quite understand it. Uh, so I'm going to skip you for now, but please rephrase it and we'll get back to you. So I'm going to go to Jacob, who is asking, uh, what is the most unequivocal spectral biosignature LUVOIR could detect? And would this convince non-astrobiologists? Good question, Jacob. <sighs> <laughs> okay, I think the first part is easier to answer than the second part. Um, I think sort of the at the moment anyway, uh, the goal sort of the gold standard in in life detection would be the sun. And, and it's actually interesting. You you can't detecting one molecule by itself is never going to be by itself. It's not a it's not a biosignature. It has to be a, at least a pairing some together to show that you've got this disequilibrium that Sanjay was talking about. Um, so for Earth, anyway, for an Earth-like planet, sort of the gold standard would be the simultaneous detection of both O2, molecular oxygen, and methane in the same atmosphere. Um, so at the moment, we think that that would be the gold standard. Um, it, it's, hard, it's really hard to do, especially the methane, because we don't actually have that much methane in our atmosphere, thank God. Um, we used to, though, in the Archean period, we did. Um, but um, it's not easy to do, and so we're actually also studying um, ways of trying to, if we detect oxygen and maybe two or three or four other molecules, but without being able to detect methane, could we could we sort of like get there, still get there? And it would be that would maybe be the silver standard of life detection. You know? um, but certainly, but still, yeah, the key certainly, point though is you, one molecule by itself. Isn't a isn't a isn't a life detection of life. It, it's got to be 
It's got to be sort of at least a complex, sort of like a chemical system. You see what I mean? So, um, as far as would anybody ever believe it? Oh, I don't know, Sandra. Maybe you could answer that better than I. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's tough because oxygen, of course, is not only produced by life. You know, in certain yeah. planetary conditions, like Sean Domingo Goldman showed, you can form geologically an excess of oxygen in the atmosphere. So it could be a false positive, which is an important yeah. trait study why, to do. That's why just detecting oxygen by itself, as intriguing as it is, isn't enough. Um, but I think Sean would say, still, still, if you got both, you could detect both oxygen and methane then that, you'd be pretty dang sure that wasn't a false positive for life. Right. So best I could do on that one. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Uh, oh, there's Janet's rephrase question. Thank you. So life on the early Earth presumably started in water. Did the early Earth atmosphere contribute to that early life? Contribute to the early life. I'm not well. Let me, well, that early I, life affected in other words, the early atmosphere for sure. And as I was hinting at before, in the Archean Earth, you know, mo all the life on this planet was mostly what I guess you call methanogens, right? They're still around today, just not as many as there were in the early times. And they didn't produce any oxygen, so we had an atmosphere that had a lot of methane in it, much more than there is today. Um, did the atmosphere contribute to life? I don't know. Um, I guess I don't, I don't quite, under, I, mean, I'm, I don't know, maybe I don't understand the question, but, um, <laughs> or maybe I just don't know the answer. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think how the environment affected biological evolution, and it certainly did, I think. Um, and we can talk about nitrogen, for example, which is a, a fundamental property for biology, but that's, that's probably too much for this conversation. Yeah, I think that's um, another topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think Do you think Louvoir, if it was scanning from far away the early Earth when there was no oxygen on our planet, could it tell whether it's it was alive or not? Do we We're know enough about, about the that. early Earth atmosphere? We are trying. We're there. We have. There are theorists who are working hard to to figure out exactly what is the test, the obs, you know, the observation test. That we would have, that we would need to do, to find out, to, to know, be able to recognize that the Archean Earth was inhabited. So obviously methane, but again, we can't just look for just one molecule. We need something else, another thing, to like really show that this can't be just chemistry or physics making this methane. Um, uh, maybe, yeah. I don't think we're quite there yet. <laughs> but people are working on it. In particular, I can think of another person here at Goddard who's working on it, and that's uh, Giada Arni. Um, she's uh, uh, she's working on. She she specializes actually in like what the Archean Earth would look like from outside. Um, and I think she does have an idea, but I don't want to explain it because it's her idea, and I don't really necessarily understand it well enough to explain it. So. So I think she does have an idea, though, which we will, when she's done, we will definitely try to incorporate into the, the capability into the Louvre mission concept. <laughs> and that's, again, an example of how uh, geologists and astronomers could work together, because the, uh, the yeah. geologists can tell you what the chemistry of the atmosphere and what the physical structure of the atmosphere are based on what the rocks are saying, because, you know, rocks are the history book of the planet. And if you can read them, then you have a lot of information that comes out of it. And then from that information, yeah. astronomers can make conclusions about exoplanets. That's just awesome. And that just shows the beauty yeah. of astrobiology. Right. But hey, <laughs> let's give a shout out to our engineers here because someone has to figure out, you know, what I do is like, you know, so I take maybe information from theorists that would, that you would get a, a theory of what would happen. Um, and then someone like me, like figures like, okay, well, how would I observe that theory? What is the measurement I need to make to test that theory? Okay, and then we turn to the next stage, which is our instrumentalist friends, the people who design instrumentation. Like, okay, I want to make this measurement. What kind of tool, what kind of instrument, tool do I need to uh, to make that measurement? And so they will come up with a concept for a design of that instrument. And then they turn, and then you turn to the engineers to say, like, okay, I have this thing I want to build. Can you actually build it? <laughs> you know. So and so this is like, you know. 
seriously, it takes a village, it takes a city actually. So, you know, to, to, to do a, a large mass emission, there's like, you know, it, it's extremely multifaceted with all different kinds, people doing all kinds of different, you know, disciplines. I'm glad you mentioned engineers. They're definitely part of the, uh, the scientific yeah, investigation yeah. process. Yeah. And uh, without yeah, they them, don't get a lot of love, but they're important. <laughs> they're so important, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there was this question that I saw about uh, becoming a scientist later in life. You know, both you and I had the, the privilege of, of, of growing up in a scientific, it's kind of the path we took, but can you become yeah. a scientist later in life after a career in something else? You yeah, think? you totally can. Uh, I'll give one really, I'll give one fun example right here from my own personal experience here. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me doing this, but uh, my two, my a summer undergraduate intern from two, three summers ago um, is Andrew Dinkowski. He, um, he, uh, he, his first bachelor's degree was in um, finance or accounting, and he did that for a while, and then I guess he decided that he didn't want to spend his life doing that. Then he became a police officer, actually. He was a Tucson City police officer. Um, and then he did that for a while. And then he decided, um, I think I really want to do that science thing after all. So he went back to school to get a bachelor's degree in physics while working full time as a campus police officer, actually. Um, and then he, he realized, uh, which didn't leave him time to do any research, but he realized that he needed to do some just to you know, find out what it was like get some experience. Um, and so he out, took one summer off from the CPs and uh, came and did a NASA summer internship um, research project with me. And he did a fantastic job on it. And now he is a graduate student at uh, studying astrobiology, in fact, at the University of Washington <laughs> in Seattle. So so yes, it is it is in it is in fact totally possible to become, you know, to become a, a, an act a professional scientist after doing other another job another career um i'm not going to say actually, yeah. i'm not going to say yeah. it's easy um i'm not going to say it's easy but it's definitely possible i have evidence that it is possible <laughs> so yeah i switched to astrobiology after a master's in engineering so i can definitely attest that it's possible <laughs> yeah yeah well, i think andrew came from even further afield i'd say <laughs> Yeah. So you 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 meant I I think you mentioned that you earlier in this in this program that you are a voracious reader and a sci-fi reader. I was wondering if you have a favorite sci-fi author and has that somehow influenced your your science or created some new ideas? Oh, oh I would suspect so. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I mean, I'm a you know, I'm a sci-fi nerd from way back. Um, you know. Star Wars, Star Trek probably is maybe even more influential um, to me, but probably, um, probably I have to say my favorite sci-fi writer, the one that I would just pick, um, or book, let me just say book or series actually, um, that would be Dan Simmons' Hyperion series, if ever, anybody, people know that one. Um, and what fascinated me about it was um, uh, this vision of, um, Oh, this vision of this really diverse, the, the diverse, really diverse paths that life that originated on Earth would, could eventually go down, um, become very different than we are. Um, I don't know. I guess you'd have to read the book. But um, also, too, um, I want to have to give a shout out to J.R.R. Tolkien, because Lord of the Rings is probably if I was stranded on a desert island for the rest of my life and I could only take one set of books with me, it would be, in fact, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, yeah, and then, and then also too, um, like I said, Star Trek, let's not underestimate the, the influence of Star Trek on all kinds of scientists, but in particular astronomers and astrophysicists. Um, you know, that the, the vision of exploring space, of actually we're going to spread out and explore space as a as species is very compelling for me. It's, Kind of like a, it's a long-term goal, <laughs> like you know, millennia. <laughs> yeah, both so. Tolkien and, uh, and and Star Trek show that you know interspecies, uh, rather interspecies living together is going to be difficult. Do you think that will affect humans yeah, well, as well? Possible. Yeah, difficult but possible. And actually, I you know, I would like. I think it's interesting to talk to and interact with um, life that's different than you are. <laughs> so, right. 
the next question is uh, by Graham again. He asks, what are your favorite ways to share your research with the broader public? I like doing stuff like this. I like, you know, I like just, you know, chatting. Um, and probably, yeah, that's probably the primary way. I also, you know, I give, I do in fact also um, give a fair, well, not a great many, but a fair number of public lectures um, thing at, uh, in smaller venues. Um, that's also, that's a good way too, because that's enjoyable too. But the best part of that, again, I always find is the question when you just get to like, you know, just chat about things. People ask questions and then you can answer them. You know, it's always, you know, people ask great questions and it actually can get can get more out that way than just from my, you know, this is what I planned to say. So um, that's, uh, to me, that's the best part actually. So, so I like I like things like this. I like the questions from a public lecture. Um, I don't write, I don't, write a lot of pop, I don't write any popular articles really, because um, uh, I'm probably not very good at that, actually. <laughs> so. To each own expertise, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see, do we have any more questions on the, the chat? No? All right. Um, so I have another one for you. If you had a room full of early career scientists, what kind of advice would you give them based on the lessons learned you've had in your career so far? Hmm. Okay. Um, early career scientists. Lessons learned. Let's say at the undergraduate level, for example. Undergraduate. Or younger. Yeah. Um, okay, so the most important thing you can do in undergrad isn't necessarily to store up a bunch of facts. It's not that. It's to learn how to ask the right questions, how to, how to think, how to ask the right questions and how to think, how to plan to answer them. Right, so that's kind of like the key, that's the root core of, of research. Um, and so if you haven't had a chance to do any research, make time, make somehow, make a way to do it. A, a, a 10 week summer research project, anything. Um, it's, you know, and that's how you, that's, that's how you'll find out if you really enjoy that process, the asking questions and figuring out how to answer them. If you really enjoy it well enough, enough to like, you know, dedicate your life to it. <laughs> um, and I'd say, um, one other piece of advice respect other people's expertise outside of science in particular is what I mean. Um, one of the things you learn at NASA like very, very vividly is that nobody does anything by themselves. It takes big teams, it takes big team to do something really big. It takes big teams with a diverse, usually diverse skill set. And, um, you know, sometimes the success of a mission will hang on your financial administrator. You know, or you know, the the the, the manager, the project manager, um, the science writers and, and graphics people that you're working with. Um, not to mention, like, you know, 10, 15 different kinds of engineer. Um, but and it's it's important to um, it's really important to respect and value. Um, everybody else's expertise and not think that their expertise that, oh, oh, well, I'm a physicist. I can do bookkeeping. Well, yeah, really? Not, you'd be surprised, actually. Maybe not very well. <laughs> you know, so that, that's another, that's another, you know, moral that I would put out there, actually. So. Cool. Thank you. So we're yeah. almost out of time. Is there any last thing you would like to add based on our conversation, Aki? Um... Gee, I don't know. Um, I guess just to um, just to just to come back again to the point I made is about you know about science that you know science is scientists. This isn't like you know this isn't like you know we're not witch, witches and warlocks here. These aren't secrets. What we do, the scientific method, being a scientist, isn't these aren't secrets. This is a it's a public process. It's a thing that everybody this doing 
science. Approaching the world like a scientist is something that humans do. Um, like I, I was trying to explain, like with the troubleshooting, the whole full idea of troubleshooting. Um, and so I just want to I just want to reemphasize that that um, people you know that you know people science it's 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 one of those things humans do, and the whole the, the thing that all those years of education and training did for me was in a way to make me a, a just into a, to give me the tools to be a super user of science. But we are all users of science. So that's those about are. It. Those are fantastic wise words to end with. Aki, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. It's very appreciated. It's been a fascinating conversation. And all of you that are watching, join us next month for Ask an Astrobiologist. Until then, stay curious and ciao for now. <laughs>